Mo Abadu, thank you for being here. You are on our Power Women list. You are on the 50 over 50. You are Netflix's biggest partner in Africa right now, founder of Ebony Life Media. You didn't start there. You weren't always an entrepreneur. I wasn't always. I th First of all, thank you so much for having me and for having this conversation and for this special event today and for celebrating all the amazing women and bringing us together. You know, it's really... It's been really inspiring and encouraging to just to see so many different women together who are all doing different things, but the common purpose is that we just want to just add value to whatever it is that we're doing. And you so are adding value. So you spent most of your career working in oil and gas and HR. Yeah, so yeah, so I hadn't, I've not always been an entrepreneur, but I think deep within me, I've always felt like an entrepreneur. And they say that the, the definition of an entrepreneur is t risk taking, right? So I have this amazing job at ExxonMobil. Um, I'd been there for a decade, head of human resources. And then I just wake up one fine day, 10 years later, and I'm like, I'm ready to go. And everybody thought, are you okay? I mean, you don't have such a great job with career prospects like that and then decide that you're gonna go. But I just felt like there was this thing within me that just wanted to do more. Was it risky? Was I afraid? Was I scared? I was all those things, but I just wasn't going to leave it there. I decided to just take the plunge, and I left my wonderful nine-to-five paying job, and I decided that go out there and make it happen. And it wasn't straight into media. Right. I set up a consulting firm called Vic Lawrence & Associates. So what I, what I was doing on the inside, I decided to do on the outside. So it was basically offering HR services, because I realized that there was a gap in the market whilst I was at Exxon for what I was doing, you know, in terms of recruitment and training and development and capacity building. There just weren't enough people on the other side doing that. So was it risky? It was still risky, mm -hmm. but I, I decided that I was gonna go out there and face it. And thankfully it worked until the bigger idea came to leave consulting and jump into media. So again, everybody's like, but Mo, why are you doing this? You left Exxon. Vic Lawrence is doing great. Now you're going to leave Vic Lawrence and go and get into the world of media. And I started with a talk show. And coming from the continent, you know, talk shows are considered like, why are you going to leave ExxonMobil? Why are you going to leave your consulting practice to go and become a TV presenter, is how it was coined. And they weren't seeing the bigger picture, that this was just basically the anchor project for me to even go further and further into the world of media. Way back in 2000, 2003, 2004, local content wasn't a big deal. Mm. We were still very much involved in whatever you Americans gave us, fed us, we took it. Not realizing how important it was for us to tell our own stories, generate our own content, talk about our own superstars, make our own superstars, and talk about things that are in our society. Now, I often say that, I, I mean, I love Oprah Winfrey. I love her show. But really and truly, how relevant is what she, whatever she's talking about, how relevant is that to the average woman in Nigeria or anywhere on the continent? They may be able to take some high-level advice from her. But if you're really dealing with, let's say, for example, your husband beats you and she has a show in America that says, call this helpline. A Nigerian can't call that helpline. She needs a local helpline to call. And there are tons and tons of women in Nigeria who are doing great work in this area. So it was about creating a platform for such things, not forgetting about our superstars who want to become models, who want to become actresses, who want to become whatever it is they want to become, giving them a platform to shine. So it was, for me, the talk show was a jump off point for whereby we could start to have that conversation around things that are important to us as Africans. We are a billion people. We do need to be able to tell our own stories. You know, and if we don't, someone else is going to tell them for us. You make a compelling argument, but I know we talked about how when you started out, I mean, you're working with Netflix now, now. but you were having, what was it, a lot of great meetings that went nowhere, the oh, typical yes. Hollywood oh, experience? Oh my God, the Hollywood experience is lovely. They say there's never a bad meeting in Hollywood. <laughs> Everybody smiles and then you sort of, you know, have champagne or you have wine and it's smiley, smiley, kiss, kiss, kiss here and there. We'll be in touch. And you collect the business cards and you send the emails and nothing happens and it's one story after the other. So, yes, we went through many years of, of that and I think it's powerful. The course, you're going to go through that. But the thing is, are you going to give up? It's about being at the right place at the right time and being able to tell the right story at the right time where the world is ready to listen. Now, 
Am I saying that all is well today? All is not well. But is there definitely um, an improvement on the situation from what it was before? 100%. Now, are most of the gatekeepers and the commissioners still, you know, um, white men, um, middle-aged white men? Very much so. Are they beginning to listen? Some of them. Are we getting more and more black commissioners or commissioners of color? It's beginning to change. So that's the work in progress. So for me, I mean, I've been going to a market called MIP TV, MIPCOM in Cannes for the last 10 years. The conversation has changed. People are beginning to listen because commercial forces are making them listen. I'm not making a case here for an agenda or a charity case or an NGO-based case. No, I'm making a commercial case for the fact that storytelling for everyone around the world, no matter where they're from, is important because there are markets around the world for you to, you know, to buy into. And Netflix, to go back, were the first ones to realize that there's a market, there's an African market. So I'd been knocking on Netflix's door before they came to Africa, you know, and they weren't listening when they weren't ready. But the minute that they were ready, because I'd been knocking and knocking and knocking, Obviously, you know, we were able to sort of continue those conversations whereby it became, okay, Mo, well, let's do a slate deal. So, you know, we, we're happy to say that we are, we are the first, you know, company to have a multi-slate deal with Netflix across the continent. And um, I think they're happy with the progress we're making. And um, we'll continue to just give them as many blockbusters as we can because it's all about the numbers. It's about mm. them coming into co to, to the continent and building their subscriber base. And we're there to help them do that. You can only do that by creating great stories that the world wants to see. Now, for Netflix, of course, primarily the audience is we want a Nigerian market, we want an African market. But I want to play in a global space. And that's why we now have grown out of not just having Netflix as a partner, but reaching out to other co-production partners that we have to include Sony Pictures Television, Stars, Lionsgate, Will Packer, Westbrook, the BBC. You know, it's taken everything you know like it's taken everything because you're sometimes just knocking and the worst thing is when someone just says we're going to respectfully pass mm. it's the worst email you're ever going to get because you believe in this project you can see it but they can't always see it so it, it, it can take some convincing and some persuasion for them to see that there's a story there but we keep knocking and the more we do the easier it becomes how do you keep convincing them? Is there a secret to what you say or is it just the persistence? It's, 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 I think it's how you package. Um, it's how you present. It's how you pitch. Um, it's trying to give them stories that are unusual. It's hoping that you've got someone at the other end that has a listening ear, that got out of bed the right side that particular day. Um, you know, it's all those things. It's really emotional intelligence. It's, are they ready to take a chance on you on a different type of story? So there's so many boxes to tick. But I think that once success has been identified, and we've seen that with Wakanda Forever and, you know, and that black stories do matter and that foreign stories do matter with Squid Games and other stories that are even not in even in English language but are doing really well. You know, so it's, by, it's, it's getting them to buy into that and using those as examples to say, listen, there is this case study, there is that case study. Come on, guys, take a risk. And we're not saying give us the budgets you're giving them in America or in the UK. Yes, we want bigger budgets, don't, don't get me wrong, because you can't give me $2 and give the other person $100 and then compare my $2 show to their $100 million show. Mm. I mean, come on. You know, so so it's, it is about, you know, give us a decent budget so we can produce a decent show that the world is going to appreciate. Thank so you. they're beginning to listen. Listening is good. <laughs> there can always be more. Always good. You talk about partnerships. I know you have some news about a new partnership that we're breaking some news right now. Yes, Tell us yes, what yes. is happening. We are breaking some news, and I'm excited to say that in partnership with Idris Elba and his company Green Door Pictures, we are going to be working on two major areas. Area one, or category one, or project one, um, is going to be taking the Ebony Life Creative Academy model that's been in existence for the last three years and taking that out across the continent. One thing we do need to do is to empower and to upskill filmmakers across the continent. If we don't do that, they're never going to be able to compete globally. 
So it's important to go in there and give them the necessary skills. So we're going to be offering courses in production, producing, script writing, directing, cinematography, sound. Um, you know, these are acting. So we have eight courses we're going to be rolling out. So the Ebony Life Creative Academy currently rolls this out now. So it's taking that model and replicating it across the continent. So that's what Idris Elba and I and his company are going to be doing. We're excited about it. I think our focus is going to be more sub-Saharan Africa because mm -hmm. that's really you know where we're from, and we think. And you can't do everything, and you can't be there for everyone. So it's really about sort of taking that part of the of, of Africa and rolling out there. We're going to be reaching out to private sector. We're going to be reaching out to multilateral agencies. We're going to be reaching out to governments to say, listen, you all have a responsibility to empower the youth and to empower this particular sector. Let's find ways of working together to make that happen. Um, the current model that we have is. Ebony Life working with the Lagos state government without their support wouldn't be able to, you know, be running these programs mm -hmm. because all our students come, it's free of charge. If you put the barrier there that they must pay for these courses, I don't think the uptake is going to be there because they can't afford it. We're trying to say let's empower these filmmakers. So they need to be able to come on those courses at no charge. So that's why we're going to be reaching out to, you know, various people and organizations to say please, let's do this together. So that's project one. Project two is... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's project one. Okay, that yeah. was project one. That was yeah, a lot. That's okay. a lot. And then there's a second part. The second project is global productions. Black storytelling. About taking our local stories from Africa and making them global. Um, finding really interesting stories of the world that you, Maggie, wants to watch. That Tracy in Essex wants to watch. But she's interested in hearing that story from the continent that's speaking to us, but also speaking to her or speaking to him. So it's, it's, it's going to be the academy on the one side and global storytelling on the other side. And we're going to be, you know, hopefully partnering with streamers and broadcasters around the world to take some of those stories on. That's so, incredible. How did yeah. this start? Did you meet at an industry event? No, or? we did not meet at an industry event. Um, Idris was interested in the academy, the Creative Academy. And um, our Creative Academy had reached out to him to say, would he come and speak? Because what we also do is we invite in faculty, external faculty or guest speakers to address our students. So you could be, it could be the acting class, it could be the producing class, it could be any of the classes, the directing class. Of course, Idris is an actor. So we said, would you please, you know, so someone at the school called Michael, Michael, hi, I'm not forgetting you. Michael reached out to Idris to say, Idris, would you please come and speak to our students? So Idris said he had heard about the great work that we were doing at the school and he would love to, but can I also, I would like to meet Mo. So I get a call from Michael saying, Michael, um, Idris Elba would like to meet you. Can I give him your number? Can you give him my number? Hello? Yes, you can give him my number. <laughs> so um, he sent me a message saying, Mo, good afternoon, very polite, you know. Um, can, we, can we speak at 5 p.m. on that day? And I was like, yes, of course. If I, whatever I was doing, I would have happily you, said, you drop, I would have it, dropped it. Yes. I said, yes, of course we can speak. And we've been speaking and speaking. This was a few months ago. We've been speaking and speaking. And until we signed the deal on working on these two, you know, incredible projects together. Um, Idris did say to me that, Mo, why didn't you reach out to me? And I was like, well, I don't know you. And, you know, you're a big <laughs> actor. I mean, I didn't know if you were... How will, I didn't have your contact details. I mean, not that I'm not bold enough to reach out to anyone, but sometimes you just know that at the right time it will come. Um, and um, he's, he's someone that I admire greatly. I have a huge amount of respect for what he's done around the world and a huge amount of respect for what he wants to do in Africa. Now, a lot of... He's not the only African in the diaspora, but for me, he is the one that I have seen that has shown the most love for wanting to come back and work in Africa. Mm. A lot of the African um, actors and producers and directors, they kind of just want to move into the American space or the British space, forgetting about the continent, not realizing sometimes that they actually have a responsibility to help grow the local economy, creative economy and film stars. You know, you know I think maybe some of them have had such a hard time breaking through They'd rather, now that they've broken through, <laughs> they'd rather just stay on that side, not understanding that it's really time for Africa now, and they should look at, if you've had some success, you know, in the diaspora, it's time for you to come back and give some of that back, 
you know. So Idris is special in that regard, in that he's so successful globally, he doesn't feel any sense of risk adverse to coming back to, 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 to working with, with, with Africa um, and, 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 and seeing how we can take global black projects to the world. Um, and to say that for those that haven't seen that opportunity, now, Will Packer has seen that opportunity. You know, um, Will Smith has seen that opportunity. The BBC have seen that opportunity. So I really want to say to, you know, to African directors and producers and in, in the diaspora that really, guys, we need to find a way of being more inclusive. And we can't keep saying we want to, you know, to be included in what's going on in the rest of the world if, you, if they're also not wanting to participate in what's going on in the continent as well. So... Idris, thank you. I am so, so excited about us working together on these creative academies and finding global you know, production deals to do with streamers and broadcasters and taking our black stories and African stories to the world. I just can't wait. I can't wait. We can't wait to see it. Mo, thank you so much. Thank you.